Welcome back to the Mole Pigs podcast. Today our guest is Erica de Benedictus. Also here today are Boya. Hi. Eric. Hi. Georgios. Hi. And I'm Hannah. Erica received her PhD in biological engineering from MIT in 2021, working with Kevin Esfeld on techniques for robotics accelerated evolution. Her interests have ranged from computational physics to astronomy to the origins of life to automating life science. After a postdoc in David Baker's lab on the use of machine learning in de novo protein engineering, she has now started her own lab in biodesign at the Francis Crick Institute in London. Erica, hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So yeah, looking at your interests, this is quite a range of topics, right? So, you know, you've started from like kind of astronomy and orbital engineering. How did you get from that to protein engineering and biodesign? What was the story behind that? Yeah, so I promise it all makes sense. <laughs> so, and it's a good story. So when I, I was first introduced to science through astronomy, so I was lucky enough, I went to this astronomy camp in high school and it was kind of my first exposure to this really cool, like cosmic thing about our universe that could be investigated just by taking pictures, right, of the sky. And I really liked that that idea that we could um, we could calculate things that sort of tell us about the universe we live in. And when I was sort of a young scientist, space science was very accessible, right, because you can use very simple models that don't have to be more complex than Newtonian physics to plan orbits to Mars, like very cool stuff with very easy math. And so I got into biology because one day halfway through undergrad, I went and tried to use all my fancy computational physics that I thought was the coolest tool in the world. And I tried to apply it to proteins. And I tried to do some molecular dynamics and simulate proteins and quickly was just shocked by how <laughs> How badly our models work, right? In life science, um, the solar system is mostly made of vacuum, which makes it really easy to model. And life science is the opposite. It's like really, really, really complicated to accurately model model molecular scale molecular scale biology. Um, and so I became just really interested in this question of where does real data come from, right? If we have a model that tries to describe the living world, how would we know if it's right? Um, and that was that was when I became an experimentalist, although it took me several years to kind of figure that out. And so I, I made this journey from computational physics to experimental life science. And now I kind of live in the middle of those two things of how do we get big data sets and actually make models out of them to do to do engineering. So when you say big data sets, is, is this why a lot of your kind of research is focused on automation? Yeah, I guess. So I, I similarly had this transition where uh, right before grad school, I was working as a, a software engineer at Dropbox. And so I was exposed to uh, what it really looks like to make, create these engineered systems that are really large and work really well because they have, they're made out of software, right? And you, you can engineer magnificent systems. Um, with software. And I went from that to grad school at MIT and discovered that there were people with these amazing liquid handling robots that like in principle can do all of our wet lab work. And they were programming them with like drag and drop GUIs, right? Like we're, we're not actually exercising the huge suite of automation we have available in life science um, for a lot of reasons. And it holds us back from doing science that is um, reproducible enough that you could actually like amass large data sets over time. Like instead, we're just collecting s small amounts of data as, as we go along and they don't, they don't, um, they, they can't be combined into something bigger than, than the individual experiment. And that's a pity because <laughs> what we'd really, what we'd really love is to do more tricks like the PDB, right? This amass data set of like half a century of, of biologist community years that has been curated enough that we can analyze it in, in the whole and come up with something like AlphaFold that, that really solves a problem because we have enough data to, to tackle it. So when you kind of first stepped out of the kind of astronomy and software engineering side of things and into the world of biology, did this kind of problem with kind of automation and big data sets and, and messiness hit you immediately and you immediately thought, we need better tools for automation or did you kind of first kind of 
dip your toes into just going to the bench with with some pipettes and, and getting more up to speed what what was your experience of going from theory to to experiment yeah i think so the thing that really caught my eye first was uh this analogy between computer engineering and biology. So like when I was in undergrad, I just, lo- I took this operating systems class and I was like, wow. Like I, I felt like I finally understood kind of how your laptop, which is like a rock can like be alive and you can program it because I, I sort of understood, you know, you write a compiler, you write an operating system and then you kind of feel like you see how it goes from a dead rock into this alive thing you can program. And I was so, um, enchanted by synthetic biology, like the Chris Voigt style synthetic biology that sort of seeks to like replicate our insights from uh, the computer revolution in biology through making standardized genetic circuits and so on and so forth. And, and I think similarly, I was really interested in the genetic code expansion stuff. I think one of the first papers that like really caught my eye was when the church lab um, uh, made C321, which is this recoded strain of E. coli that has one codon totally deleted so that you can replace it with something new. And I was like, wow, like we're reaching down into the biology operating system and our engineering is good enough. We can actually move things around now. Like this is going to be so interesting. Um, so so I entered I entered synthetic biology from more the conceptual angle. And it was only later that I realized my sort of practical hands-on engineering mechanical skills were like also useful right um that that came later you mentioned george church so he kind of removed one and, and subsequently three um if if i remember right subsequently three codons from from e coli but you went kind of in a in a even more extreme direction you, you tried to expand the genetic code to include four letter codons why how yeah so, so that project, uh, it came about in a way I'm not necessarily the most proud of, which is that like many synthetic biologists, I had a hammer and I was looking for a nail. Um, so I, I knew I, I sort of like intuitively knew that I wanted to do this high throughput protein engineering platform because it seemed obvious to me that it was useful and that the ability to do, um, to, to, to run evolution in parallel, essentially. Easy analogy to multi-core computers really appealed to me as someone coming out of computer science. And so that, that was sort of what I knew I wanted to do. And, and very early on in my PhD, I um, did, did preliminary experiments that convinced me it would work on a technical level. And the question became, what is the right application of this technology that that sort of is a nice example to people of what we can do now that we couldn't do before. And like many tools in synthetic biology, it's like a funny shape, right? Like you're, you're making a tool because you have some intuition that it will be useful, but not necessarily because you have like the world's killer app and you like also want to, to you know, realize the application. Um, So like, I mean, as another example, like short read Illumina sequencing, right? It's not the tool you'd want. You don't want short reads. No one wants short reads. We all want long reads, but it it turns out even though it's a technology that has these funny properties, it's super useful, right? Um, So anyway, I, you know, I find myself mid PhD with this platform that lets me do hundreds of evolutions at the same time. And I'm like, wow, uh, what's some enormous protein engineering problem I can suddenly tackle that everyone thought was crazy because they didn't have the ability to evolve hundreds of proteins at the same time. They had to go one at a time. And I was like, okay, how about we do something in translation, right? Translation is this part of biology that has on the order of hundreds of components. Um, And so it's the sort of problem that is the right shape to be solved by the technology I had created. Um, and so, yeah, I, I sort of went looking for a problem that sort of had the right features and um, ended up with this, you know, really interesting project that kind of taught us a little bit about basic science of how tRNAs and, and the genetic code itself works and how flexible it is to being engineered. Um, but uh, I think it was it was I'm so I was so delighted by the project, but also I think it's like a cautionary tale about synthetic biology. Right. That I think sometimes we 
it's a uh, it's sometimes quite an art. <laughs> and so so I guess like as I move forward, I, I sort of try to pick problems both with the intuition that the tool is useful and also like really knowing the final application I have in mind with varying success. So when you started that project, how confident were you that that was going to work, that the tRNAs would be amenable to that codon expansion? Or uh, was this kind of, you had pieces of it working and then you just had to like launch and hope it would work for all, you know, hundreds of proteins involved? So when I started the project, I looked at the literature and I was like, okay, uh, this seems to work in the few examples that people have actually tested. And what hasn't happened is no one has come along who is crazy enough to like actually try to do it for hundreds of things at once. Like all we do, it, it's, you know, we do, we do this sort of engineering for like one, one component at a time. And so that was part of why I felt like it was a good match with this. Every time you do an evolution project, you don't know whether or not it's going to work, right? There, there's no way to know if there's like headroom for improvement for a, a certain protein towards some weird new activity that you imagine. And so kind of the best you can get is knowledge that like proteins of a certain class like tend to be amenable to this sort of engineering. And so that was exactly the scenario I was in. It was like kind of the best case scenario um, uh, to ask for. And like, yes, you don't know if it will work. And that, that's one of the things that, that I then thought a lot about in my PhD, which is this, this sort of existential issue we have with directed evolution as an engineering technique, which is that you're never sure if it's going to work. And it often fails. It's like super unreliable. And that's because it's not an engineering tool like CAD. It's not something you can build out of small parts. It's this weird stochastic thing that relies on evolution and like only sometimes works out. And so that that theme also of like being unsure of like whether or not your evolution will work and and seeking to make it more robust. That was like also something I ended up doing a lot of stuff on during my PhD and, and discovering that some of the automation can can make things more robust also. Yeah, because you're never quite sure what the fitness landscape looks like a priori, right? Um, and so how much kind of basic science did you do on the pathway to get to the working four letter code um, or on the final product? And like, did, did you, uh, you know, solve structures for all your modified proteins or did you just say this works? Here's a couple of interesting ones. This is one of the things that was hard because I think um, when, when you do molecular engineering, kind of the 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 standard way you write the paper is you engineer one protein and then you do exquisite characterization on it you crystallize it you study it chemically you purify it you do all this beautiful work and so the question becomes like okay that's beautiful now we're doing it in high throughput and maybe we can engineer the proteins in high throughput but we don't have techniques for like doing all of that follow up in high throughput. So what do you do? <laughs> and and that was a, an interesting question as well. It's like you if you if you swap out like some component of your engineering pipeline, suddenly you have some enormous need to do the next everything that comes after it, like in higher throughput. Um, and so what I ended up doing was I, I kind of I kind of arrived at a compromise, right? So I would have these evolution experiments where I was testing like 20 or 96 or, you know, a couple hundred different things. And I would analyze the results of those bulk experiments. And then I would also select some individual ones and do the more extensive characterization. So there ended up being this funnel of like high throughput to low throughput, but traditional workup. Um, and that ended up satisfying everyone. But but I think that's a, it's like an interesting motif to encounter, right? Because like when you make high throughput techniques, um, you you can't make it for the whole pipeline at once necessarily. And so, so you end up in this weird position trying to sort of talk about what you did. So you talk about these kind of 96 or well, 20 or 96 different samples, each of which is going through a high throughput evolution experiment. Um, so firstly, I, I think so. This is you're describing France, right? Um, mm -hmm. This new automation technology you, you developed. 
So what is it that France provides that Pace doesn't? So, so Pace is kind of what's going on in each of these worlds, right? So why do the kind of selection criteria within each of those not suffice? What what goes differently when you have all of these in parallel as well as the high parallelism in each individual well? Yeah, so it's kind of subtle. So so Pace is this um, technique so um, maybe backing up, directed evolution is a technique we use to engineer things on the molecular level. It's kind of like the molecular level equivalent of like breeding dogs or cultivating roses. You kind of use evolution um, to help you engineer something that you can't necessarily do rationally, right? You just diversify and you select and you repeat. Um, so so face is a um, molecular technique that allows us to accelerate that process. Um, by using a virus, essentially. Viruses have a really fast life cycle. So uh, when you evolve things with a virus, it goes really quickly. PACE uh, is this technique that was developed by my grad school advisor, Kevin Esvelt, when he was in David Liu's lab. Um, and for a long time, the Liu lab was the only place that did PACE um, because it's, it's a really, it's just kind of a tricky technique to do. It requires that you do both really good molecular biology and really good sort of mechanical engineering and, and like having all this tubing and pumps and stuff like that. And so what I was looking for was a way to take this really tricky technique that's hard to do even in very low throughput and do it in very high throughput. Um, and I ended up with something super, super straightforward, which is just I took a liquid handling robot and it literally just uses pipettes to do lots of pipetting. <laughs> That's it. I replaced I replaced continuous flow pumps with just pipetting. Yeah. So so what Prance does that Pace does it is it is a relatively easy technique that lets you do hundreds of Pace experiments at once. Um, so if you're setting up a Pace experiment, it probably takes you hours and hours of like sterilizing equipment just to run like four experiments or maybe eight, uh, if you do twice as much, uh, set up twice as much tubing. Um, and with Prance, all you have to do is you just put the proteins you want to evolve it, the DNA for them in the 96 well plate. You just put it on a robot and you press a button, basically. Um, and and this means that it, it kind of changes how you go about the engineering in a way that's kind of subtle. Like on, on one hand, it's like really straightforward. Literally, you can just run more experiments. Um, on the other hand, because you suddenly can run more experiments, you make really different choices. So you no longer have to pick and choose like exactly which experiments are the most important to run. So you can suddenly run experiments on all of the homologs in a family rather than just picking your favorite. Or you can run replicates. No one ever runs replicates, right? But you can now run replicates, which is super useful because you can see um, which mutations uh, are convergent, so which, uh, which changes you see to your protein that are common amongst all the times you evolve a protein, uh, you know, toward a, new, toward a new function, which tells you, like, what, what matters. Um, and you can also do things like, uh, <laughs> again, really basic, you have space for controls, right? You can run control evolutions that help you understand, um, uh, help you surface more information about, like, what's happening to your protein. Um, than than you can with, can without controls. So so yeah, it, it changes it changes uh, how you do engineering in ways that are kind of subtle and and kind of the overall result of that is you end up being able to evolve more proteins more comprehensively more reliably and you get uh you get data out about what your protein is doing and how it works not just an evolved genotype. So it becomes like a scientific tool that you can you can really test hypotheses um, and like understand how your protein works, not just an engineering tool for making a protein that does something. So with the larger data you can get with the new technique, is the data analysis process more complicated than before? And how more complicated is it? Yeah, for sure. So I have this picture in my thesis defense um, that that talks about this challenge of, of you know, forget running hundreds of evolutions, suppose you're just running one, right? Then at the end of this experiment, you have all these time points and you, you would like to understand the whole history of how your protein evolved and like, when did it start getting better? When did the mutations occur? All this stuff. 
And so you end up with this need to do a huge amount of analysis, right? Kind of this picture in my PhD defense of me holding a stack of plates that's like half, like, you know, as tall as I am. And I'm like trying to open the door with my foot, right? Because like I don't have enough hands to even carry the plates that are just analyzing one experiment. And then now we're running hundreds of them at once. So, you know, yeah, the data analysis becomes uh, prohibitive because suddenly you like can't analyze what happened because you're doing hundreds of times more science than you did before. And we kind of solve that by um, just like, again, swapping out the techniques you use when you're done. So instead of uh, working things up individually, suddenly you just send everything off for sequencing and do it computationally and then, and then fish out what you want to analyze more later. I mean, a te technique like that. So, so yeah, the, the analysis needed to be swapped out so that it was suitable to handle a higher throughput experiment. I wonder, like, how important did you find, or how much difference did you find in different replicates now that you could do them? Because, like, maybe you, I'd imagine that maybe the genetic landscape is quite noisy, but the structure landscape is maybe less noisy because we say structure is more conserved than sequence. But so did you find tons of convergent evolution? Or like when, when, when you do have replicates, do you find a lot of like cool divergence? Some of both. Uh, I guess what's cool about having replicates is you can now distinguish things that are convergent from things that are divergent, right? So, so we did one experiment where we evolved um, a whole bunch of different biomolecules. They were actually, they were tRNAs, they weren't um, proteins. And because the tRNAs are really small, they're like a hundred base pairs, um, the whole tRNA will fit inside of a single read of a like an NGS read. And so we were able to characterize for the entire history of all of these tRNAs with all the replicates and all the conditions evolving, how the, the entire composition of those populations over time. So we got like a whole evolutionary history for these, these proteins. And it was cool. Uh, there was some of both, right? So there were some instances where there were a couple tRNAs that were like quite um, predictable in in their evolution across replicates, they tend to do the same thing at like you know roughly the same time, and you see essentially this similar results. Um, there were a couple other instances where, depending on the details of how you conducted the experiment, how um, how difficult you made the environment, you would actually get even different genotypes out of the same evolution, right? Um, so so yeah, this finally gives us a tool where we can pick that apart. Right. We don't just see the endpoint. We can see like the kinetics of of when these genotypes arise. So you also did some experiments to kind of evolve the ribosomes to better accommodate four letter codons. I guess there's there's a lot to unpack there. But one, did you find that you could on the ribosome side focus more on the proteins or did you also need to evolve the ribosomal RNAs? And what was it like trying to modify the ribosome i know in the kind of like um synthetic cell communities that they at least my impression is that there's a, a lot of struggle going on in trying to kind of evolve orthogonal ribosomes or, or build them from scratch so what was your experience like that yeah so when i first started this project the thing that i thought i would spend most of my time doing was ribosome evolution because that's something, I mean, it's a big outstanding problem. There's a ton of reason why we want to evolve the ribosome. We'd love to make non-canonical polymers like more generally. Um, so there's lots of work going on on that. And I, I felt like, you know, the continuous evolution stuff was a really powerful tool that hadn't been applied to that yet. So I really wanted to do that. Um, and I was working with Ahmed Badran, who was a, a Broad fellow at the time. And his group was really interested in this too. They were they were like already doing some some ribosome evolution stuff, and it was actually I mean I think we learned a lot about <laughs> the ribosome. Um, I didn't end up evolving the ribosome much at all to do four base codon translation. I mostly focused on the tRNAs, um, but it was very cool. You know, in the in the process of trying to set up the evolution so that we could put pressure on the ribosome to get better at you know various tasks. Um, we, for example, we learned that uh, one, of, one of the big problems people face in, in synthetic ribosome engineering is like ribosomes are these two subunits. There's the big and the small. And the subunits um, are engineered to associate and dissociate like as translation happens. And because of that, if you're trying to evolve a ribosome as like a unit, 
uh, is really hard because the two pieces will keep falling apart and coming back together. And so people have come up with like stapled ribosomes and all sorts of techniques for trying to keep them, uh, get the pairs to interact that you're engineering. Um, and we found we, you know, Ahmed had, um, I met a Natalie Kolber, who was this amazing lab tech. She's now now in grad school at Stanford, but um, she she did this project where she she searched through all these different bacteria and took their ribosomal RNA and tried to use it in E. coli in this synthetic system that we were going to use for evolution. And she found that the subunits of these different ribosomes will like exchange even when the two halves are from like totally different species. Right, like the ribosome is so engineered to do this subunit exchange that it's like it's capable of doing it even with super super divergent halves. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, I think the moral of the story was we learned a ton about ribosomes and didn't engineer them yet, but I think it's still a good idea. <laughs> you've looked at and, and you've talked a bit about currently your your protein engineering work from a kind of direct evolution perspective, and and a bit about how kind of the insights you can get into that are maybe less than we would like but you've also worked on protein engineering from a different perspective um in with with david baker which is the kind of the computational um engineering of protein so maybe from a broad perspective what can and can't we do with protein engineering right now and what Mm. techniques do we have if you want to kind of go out and build x protein yeah so i i have always been really interested in in david baker's work um Obviously, like, (laughs) it's very appealing to people who like the synthetic sort of bottom up approach. And I was really interested to do this postdoc in the Baker lab because I guess I I wanted to go there and like discover what de novo proteins I wanted to make. Right. I wanted to I wanted to go there and like really learn the ins and outs of what de novo protein engineering is like capable of doing and what it's like not it's not yet really what's not yet feasible. And, and so I ended up um, working on the de novo binder design pipeline, which is this strategy for, it's actually quite amazing. I mean, pretty reliably, just totally on the computer, we can go from a, a crystal structure of a target protein to engineering like a really small little alpha helical brick that will like fit into a groove and bind with like decent affinity that can be matured. Right, which is it's like one of the it's one of the first de novo protein engineering pipelines that like works pretty reliably. Um, not not all proteins, uh, not all target proteins will work, but like you have a good shot. Um, and what was funny to me was that although this pipeline works like pretty reliably, the de novo proteins are like super different than natural proteins. So like the de novo mini binders, for example, they're really small, they're alpha helical, they're rigid, and they have absolutely no loops. <laughs> Rosetta can't do loops. Uh, loops are flexible. And that's that's actually why natural binding proteins have loops, because uh, the you know loops on antibodies, for example, they can get up in the nooks and crannies of a target protein and make a ton of contacts. And so what's funny is like the things that make natural binding proteins good at binding are exactly the things that mean we can't de novo engineer those proteins. And um, I guess to me, I'm like, I'm really interested in chasing this junction between when things are predictable and modelable and when they start being like alive. And so I, I feel like that that's the junction I want to hit with my protein engineer. I want to I want to make it so that we can start designing things that are a little bit flexible and that maybe do have some loops. Um, and I would love to be able to create models that's, you know, the ne- you know, next version of alpha fold that doesn't just predict rigid structure proteins that adopt like, you know, well folded states, but maybe can also tell us about how they're allosteric or dynamic or how they move around a little, um, because those, those things really matter. And that's what makes the natural proteins really good at things many, m- much of the time. How do you envision the output for this like future protein structure prediction and design tool looking like? Because like right now you get an alpha fold, a PDB structure. It's rigid. It's kind of a snapshot. What what would this look like if you're engineering in all the rest of this? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that prevents us from understanding how allosteric works or how dynamic proteins work is actually we just we don't have the vocabulary to talk about it. We don't have the brains to think about it, right? Like proteins 
don't exist as rigid structures. They exist as conformational ensembles. Um, but as humans, we're not good about thinking in statistical mechanics language. Like that's not how our brains work. We like things we can see and hold. And that's what a PDB file is. It's like a, one structure you can look at and think about. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, there's, there's maybe some, some first attempts though that are already going on. So like, for example, um, alpha fold, when you look up a protein that has some disordered bits, it will show those to you in like orange. Okay. So like, that's, that's a good start. And I, I actually kind of love that, right? Cause it, it used to be, if you looked up a protein in the PDB, it just wouldn't show you the disordered pieces at all. And now alpha fold is like, look, we're so good at predicting the ordered parts. We're not afraid to show you the bits that like are predicted to be uncertain or predicted to be moving, right? This is like the, um, there's a, there's a, a, a thing, NMR, if you, if you watch an NMR talk, they'll always show you this slide where they show you a, a video of a horse galloping with its like legs. And then they show you the same video if you just delete the moving parts, which is just a horse like levitating. Right. And that that's what we're doing with proteins right now. We're just looking at a levitating horse and pretending like we understand it rather than uh, developing more sophisticated representations of the moving parts that are functional. What do you think needs to go into development of computational tools to bridge this gap? Yeah, so I guess. Um, well, the tool I like is evolution and experiment, right? Mm -hmm. So the the thing I want to do, the angle I want to take is um, using our ability to engineer and evolve proteins that their function relies on the fact that they move to build the models that, that sort of tell us <laughs> what matters. Um, so like in particular, like one of the topics my lab works on is um, this question of how to make uh, make fusion proteins. So if you have one protein that's an enzyme that does some function and you have another protein that's a sensor, so maybe it changes shape in response to a small molecule or it's optogenetic, it changes shape in response to light. How could you engineer a fusion between those proteins that's like functional, where like the sensor now actually controls the enzyme, not just uh, decorative, where you have a flexible linker and they don't talk to each other. And, and this is, you know, this is something when we look in nature, this is super useful, right? Uh, like CRISPR was once just a fusion of a RNA binding domain and a nuclease. And then over, over many years of evolution, it ended up being this like, you know, exquisitely entangled thing that works as a single unit. And so we need to be able to do that if we actually want to be able to mix and match the components we have. And I think within those engineering projects are data sets that tell us this. Uh, they, don't, they don't force us to measure the dynamic structure of thousands of proteins, but we can easily measure the function of thousands of proteins and whether or not they're allosteric, whether or not they're talking to each other. So that's my approach. I want functional data sets out of my evolution experiments. So kind of a hybrid approach, look like you make some basic fusion, kind of computationally synthesize it, then run it through a bunch of France experiments, get yep. data, and then can we then feed that back into like Rosetta or something and iterate, or, or is it just a evolution at that point? Would, would love to. I, I think the, the goal is to, um, I'd love to be able to design these like on the computer, right? Like uh, if, if our computational tools are working, I shouldn't need Prance. <laughs> France is just a crutch to get us to the point where our computational tools just do it for us, right? Um, it's a very useful crutch because you can take a computational tool that doesn't do the engineering like all that well, and you can like fix it up, right? Um, so that's what we're going to do. I mean, right, you know, we're going to go try to design some of these fusion proteins with AlphaFold and, you know, Rosetta and figure out what models work, fit them to, fit them to data we produce and, and try to improve the models like iteratively. Can you talk a little bit about that dynamic of going from the uh, Prance-based experimental wet lab evolution to going to the Rosetta-based computers doing the evolution, and then you're trying what the computer spits out? I know Rosetta spits out like many options, and not all of them work. But can you talk a little bit about how your experimental design was different and how your thought process was different when going from the, the lab doing the work to the computer doing the work? Well, I guess I haven't actually closed this loop yet. So I just started at the Crick and where we just bought our Prance robot. It'll get delivered in like a couple of months. Right. Um, 
And so I guess I think that's, I think closing the loop is actually, it's kind of the big thing the community is trying to do right now. I, I think many of us have this intuition that um, if only we could take the results of our experiment and feed it back into what experiment is designed the next time. And, and we've achieved success in like modest instances. And the question remains whether that's the next big thing, right? Like, is the next alpha fold going to be the result of like online learning or not? Maybe not. Um, so I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know when I figure it out. <laughs> so you mentioned your new lab, but there's there's something I want to talk about before we get on to your new lab, which is um, the bio automation challenge, which I think has evolved from all of your all of this interest you have in in automation. What is the bioautomation challenge? Yeah, so about a year ago, um, I was doing my postdoc in, in David Baker's group. Um, I had discovered that I really needed a better data set. I needed a higher fidelity data set about these mini binder proteins that they had been engineering for years. So samples were in the fridge and we just needed to recollect a whole bunch of data about them. And I discovered that probably the best way to do this would, was to do a really simple assay, super robust, in small volume. And the problem was we didn't have an acoustic liquid handling instrument, the best resource protein engineering lab in the world, like literally. And we didn't have the instrument we needed to like collect a data set that we wanted. Um, and so I was like, wow. <laughs> I could spend some time like writing an equipment grant and waiting six months and waiting for this instrument to get delivered and like getting the assay to work on it. Or I could just figure out how to get the Baker Lab a Cloud Lab account, right? That's in principle the solution to this problem also that's been around for a decade. I mean, Cloud Labs are not a new concept and they're used in industry. It's just in academia, we have no access. No one actually uses the automation we have made. And so I was like, OK, uh, let's go make a grant program. Right. Uh, like uh, there's no way to pay for this. I, I can't. There's no there's no grant I can apply for that will give me access to this huge resource that I want. So let's go do that. Uh, and paradoxically, it was it was easier to get like everybody in the scientific community access to a Cloud Lab grant program than it was to just get the Baker Lab access to a Cloud Lab grant program and thus I created this bioautomation challenge, which is which is just that um, uh, Schmidt Futures uh, was interested in this sort of thing. So they do a lot of um, philanthropic investment in science, especially around ideas like this, like sort of disruptive. Why don't we do it this way? Like, why doesn't anyone fund this sort of ideas? And so um, they they sponsored a, a grant program and we um, awarded eight different labs access to Emerald Cloud Lab, which is one of the two main cloud labs in the US, including the Baker Lab, <laughs> um, which ironically I'm no longer at, so I don't get to enjoy the access, but <laughs> they, they, are, they are in fact uh, trying out, you know, collecting higher fidelity data with it. What is the current state of cloud labs? What, what can you do with them? What, what kind of experiments that are routine can be moved onto them? Or is it mainly for when you're doing these really interesting experiments with liquid handling robots and things like that. It's it's kind of interesting. So so cloud labs have been around for a while and they have a lot of customers in industry. And because the customers are in, in industry, they don't share. So if you go online, there's like very little code. There's no like GitHub repos of like people doing their exper their their science in the cloud. Um, which is not to say it's not quite well built out. So, so both Emerald and Stratios have actually pretty well built out labs. You can do like most things, like pretty much everything, actually. You can do in a, like a normally resourced wet lab. You can do remotely by writing a script and pressing execute um, at Emerald. Um, and, so, and so it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I think kind of my summary of the current state is that it's a really good thing we're getting academics like to start to use these platforms because that's where the open source software comes from, right? Like if we actually want to build out the Cloud Lab ecosystem, we need a lot more of that. We need a lot more people doing open science in this, this new way that is like fully reproducible because at the end of the day, you just have a script that gets executed. That is your science. So I kind of remember a talk from Oh, I think it was quite a few years ago now where 
they were talking about cloud labs and kind of training a lot of undergrads to kind of do script based tasks. So I would, when when you submit a job to um, to one of these cloud lab providers, how much is automated and how much is it kind of you've given a script that someone is then kind of going through the steps and and doing each task? I think it depends. I mean. Uh... There are actually a bunch of different software stacks that all kind of have the same concept of let's compile some set of instructions into something that's executable by some mix of robots and humans. And sometimes what that looks like is sort of more on the aquarium side of things, which is this software stack that was developed at University of Washington, um, the Clavins Lab. And in that scenario, it's mostly compiled into instructions for lab techs. And and in fact, the Baker lab has a a biofab that like employs undergrads who they they turn up, they get their printout of like, here are the things you're going to do. And they're able to execute some experiment um, that, you know, someone someone wrote Um, on the other side of things is sort of more the robotic cloud labs, which have a similar concept. You write a script, it compiles. And then it compiles like mostly into robotic instructions, but also into instructions for someone putting a plate on the deck of the robot, uh, stuff like that. So, so there's some amount of like uh, sample handling always that happens with humans because, you know, someone has to open the tape on the box from IBT or something like that. But um, they, they kind of vary actually in, in the extent to which they are fully automated versus also having some humans involved. Um, and it's funny because I think I think it's actually it's actually a good thing to um, not be uh, to to allow humans to like do tasks that are just like easy for the humans. I think the the robot should be doing tasks that the humans can't do, like acoustic liquid handling. Like no one can pipette like a quarter of a microliter because that's that's like that's not how it works. Um, and so I think I think the it's actually, it's like a really good thing to get this healthy mix of like humans, like enabling the robots to do things that are better than the humans and vice versa. So what other um, experiment that can be done in the robotic way other than pipetting? Yeah. So I guess um, a lot of the groups who are in the bio automation challenge are doing, there's several of them that are doing variants on protein engineering, various protein engineering projects. And a lot of those um, at one point or another uh, will uh, produce proteins in a cell-free system, purify them, column-based, plate, plate-based columns or something like that. And then you can do chemical analysis. So Emerald has a, a quite a lot of like analytic chemistry instruments. Um, so you can do like HPLC and you can do mass spec. I mean, you can do the entire suite of like chemical analysis. Um, so, so quite a lot of that. I mean, like most of the standard stuff you think of, uh, like running gels and doing tissue culture and sort of, sort of everything you can imagine is like pretty much everything is available, <laughs> right? Um, I guess we can't do cryo-EM at Emerald, but, um, but you know, they, they have like a colony picking robot coming online. I mean, I mean the, the, the capabilities are pretty well built out. Um, and it's it's kind of a matter of having people get those first examples of like functional scripts that have like nice controls built in so that it's really easy to just like clone it on GitHub and like get going yourself with your own samples. So I, I think what, what needs to be built out is more the sharing, like the code sharing infrastructure and less the like hardware infrastructure. So um, like, let's say, let's say someone did want to do some Kind of directed evolution or protein engineering work locally maybe in the same style that you do um like what is the kind of tech that you know you might need can i get away with just a basic like cheap open trans or do i need something a bit more sophisticated you mentioned kind of acoustic liquid handling like what's the barrier to entry well i think unfortunately i think open trans is doing great they are unfortunately probably not quite enough uh to do the type of directed evolution i do anyway the prance style um, so that that evolution technique requires that you have something that does pretty good, pretty clean pipetting, relatively low, like not spraying things everywhere because you have phage, so you can cross contaminate things. And it needs a 96 head, so it needs a head that has 90 picks up 96 pipette tips at once. I think OpenTrans doesn't have that yet. Um, so so that particular one is still 
still pretty hard. You still need relatively specialized equipment for it. So we use like a Hamilton. Um, I think the space there is increasing though. There's a bunch of new startups that are trying to be like OpenTron's version version two of like being the uh, like high reliability, low cost flatware. Um, and I think they will, I think they will likely be successful. I think, so, I think there will be a winner there. Right. So I, th I think the cost is coming down. Um, but for now, the, you know, quite a lot can be done with, uh, you know, quite a lot can be done with OpenTrons, just not Prance. Okay. So I think, um, well, yeah, there's the to topic you, you mentioned earlier that I want to now move on to, which is your new lab. So, um, I guess as first, what what are you doing with your new lab? What's your goal and mission? Yeah, it's very cool. I've been wanting to start a lab for a long time, so <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, yeah, so the the new lab it's at the Francis Crick Institute, which is this um, London's trying to become a biotech hub, and so they have this fancy new institute, kind of like the Broad. Uh, lots of um, lots of collaboration space, lots of emphasis on. Um, people talking to each other, having a community. Um, and yeah, so my group is doing a, kind of the intersection of uh, robotics and, and protein engineering. So we're trying to figure out how to uh, take our protein engineering to the next level and allow us to design and evolve proteins that work because they're structurally dynamic. Um, that's kind of on the molecular level. Uh, we kind of have this standard toolkit of like being able to do directed evolution with automation, which means we get, you know, decently sized data sets. And that can also be applied like one level up on the like whole genome engineering. So we also have some projects that have an eye toward um, uh, engineering organisms, especially non-model organisms for biomanufacturing, um, stuff like that. And so with your new lab, how did, what was the process for deciding on project number one? Was it a like exploratory thing to develop some data? Did you go for the moonshot? W what was that first project and how did you come to it? Well, there are many unspoken rules uh, about how to become a faculty. Um, for example, what is a chalk talk? I didn't know what a chalk talk was the first time I gained one. I'd never seen one. It's like this crazy secret society you have to get into to become a professor. And Having an example of a first project that meets sort of academia's taste for what a first project should be, that it is simultaneously inspirational, but also so easy a grad student can do it or whatever the thing is, that that takes some some doing to figure out sort of how to tell the story, like in, in the way that people accept it. Um, I guess at the end of the day, my project, my my lab um, is kind of broken down into projects that are sort of like the first project. So I found some nicely de-risked first evolution targets that are like a nice opportunity for us to embark upon this di direction of, of structurally dynamic protein engineering with, with evolution. Um, but then also this, this sort of other camp of like the whole organism scale engineering and the biomanufacturing, which is a little more out there and high risk. And so I can kind of, I can kind of turn the knob on how high risk I want my lab to be by balancing like those two halves. And I think the traditional advice I would get is to focus entirely on cranking out low risk or nature papers in the first few years. And I, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm doing it my way. So talking about risk, not only did you kind of jump into starting a new lab pretty soon after your PhD, which is very impressive, but you also moved country to do it. What? what kind of challenges did, did that add in and, and did that make things harder? Like how did you set things up to then just move country and, and start a new lab if, as if starting a new lab isn't hard enough? Yeah, it was really, it was really confusing. <laughs> um, I had, you know, when I got to Boston for grad school, I was like, oh, wow, like this is where I want to stay. Like I finally, I love this culture. I can like see myself being here long term. And so I thought that was what was going to happen. And uh, life took a different direction. And my my husband has a, a job in London. And so during COVID, we found ourselves um, eight time zones separated, uh, trying to both do our academic careers. And I decided it was time to time to move to London. And 
again, total surprise, like not what I expected to have happen. And it involved like there's a, you know, science is both the same and different <laughs> on this side of the pond. It's like, you know, it just there's so many cultural differences that are take, take, really take time to like understand. I, I think also like in the UK, there's just a, a different cast of characters, right? So like I, I knew all the people in Boston um, and I had relationships with them. And then coming here, it's like, oh, wow, this is a, a whole new world and like totally different people to sort of interact with and have as colleagues. And so it really took a while to move, both literally and scientifically. But it's very cool now because I think, uh, you know, I get postdoc candidates from people who, for whatever reason, they like have to be in London. And I would never have access to those people if I were in Boston. They would be going to the church lab, right? And so it's it's very cool, actually, to kind of um, be this like attractor for this particular type of science in a, a place that's maybe a little a little less of the usual suspect for it, because I, I get these amazing, amazing scientists to work with. Um, so I think it's I think it's worked out overall. But yeah, I would I would I I would not underestimate the cultural difference. It's like there's a lot to understand. Yeah, I want to hear more about these cultural differences. What was the biggest shock you experienced when you came over? Oh, I think that there's a particular flavor of sort of like glam science, glam sin bio that's done in Boston of like you publish like a lot of focus on publishing flashy papers and being very forward with what you see the application being and stuff like that. And I think um, I think there's this really lovely trend actually of how in the UK people are um, they really value like like subfield experts like they really like scientists who have this really deep understanding of like the how how very specific things actually works like quite quite niche knowledge. And there's a little less um, less imperative to translate that all the way back up into a glamorous paper that everyone can understand and be impressed by, which I think is is both healthy, but also like the communication is important, too. So, so there's just a little there's a bit of a different balance there. Um, and it just means that when you talk to people, you have to totally change how you think about what they're telling you and how they're communicating and like what their papers look like. And you have to listen differently, like knowing that they are aiming for this different style of communication and this different style of um, this different like scientific taste, different value system. Um, so I, I think it's very different. Uh, there's, there's also, you know, there's similarities too. I mean, like Jason Chin is a, um, a very U S style researcher who's in the UK, for example, in synthetic biology. So, so, you know, there are exceptions to every rule. <laughs> I read that you're trying to engineer a model organism for Mars. So like, which, which one, uh, why, how? Yeah. So I guess I was, I've been going back to my roots and I've been trying to figure out why we don't use biotech in space science more. Um, you know, biomanufacturing is this amazing in-situ resource utilization tool, right? We can take atoms from where we're at and transform them into bioplastic and food and all the things that we need. And it's it's funny to me, actually, that space science has not more directly invested in developing and building out those, those capabilities. Um, and as someone who used to work at NASA, like, it's, it's partially cultural, right? The, the mindset you use to engineer devices, which NASA is so good at, is just totally different from the biotech mindset. And so I would love to bridge that gap, right? I would love to make um, the organisms that we're going to use to like make useful stuff when we go to other planets. And then in addition, before you get to that stage, you also just have this need for having model organisms that you use inside in relatively traditional bioreactors to make useful things in a, in a more a more traditional way, but using unusual medias that contain Mars dirt um, and so on and so forth. As a new PI working in a new kind of science, you're, you're bringing this interface of big data, robotics, uh, and biotech. Um, what are kind of the skills you want to see in your upcoming students? And what are the skills that you're trying to nurture in like the next generation of scientists? Well, I guess a big one that I think helps me that I think is essential is 
what I'd maybe call like algorithmic thinking. So like the ability to think about um, the processes you're doing, whether they are physical processes you're implementing on a liquid handling robot or computational processes you're doing on data and like whether they make sense. <laughs> um, how long will they take order of magnitude, right? Like this is big O notation style thinking. Um, and I think that is really important because if you're using automation and working with big data, you inevitably run into these issues where you um, have to identify like what is limiting about some experimental pipeline and you have to fix it. And you have to have just like, really, you have to be really logical about reasoning through those engineering challenges and, and the sort of computer science preparation, like theoretical computer science preparation is like actually really good for that, regardless of whether the system you're designing is software or it's some experimental pipeline on a liquid handling robot or, or whatever it is. Um, and so that's something that I like to see, uh, you know, people who either actually have CS background or um, clearly already think that way, even though they were never taught, right? Or sort of, sort of like are amenable to, to that style of thinking. It seems like we're going towards a, or, um, you know, an automated future. Like this is like, this is just how it goes, right? We're going towards an automated future in the lab. So I wonder like maybe for young students, what are the skills they should be focusing on considering maybe when they go and do their PhDs, most of their time is no longer going to be spent pipetting anymore right they may even they may even never pick up a pipette even though they're going to do wet lab work maybe like that's conceivable right maybe i wouldn't i wouldn't proclaim in-person science to be dead quite yet um i think i suspect that what's going to happen is that larger and larger like fractions of the experimental work we do will end up being done in some automated standardized way um, and that doesn't mean the in-person stuff will totally disappear, right? Like there's always some part of your science that benefits from you looking at it and smelling it and seeing it and having it in front of you. And we already see workflows sort of be divided between things that are outsourced and standardized and things that are done in person. So like no one synthesizes their own oligos. You order them from IDT. No one does their own Sanger sequencing anymore. You outsource it to GeneWiz. And, and so we already have these workflows that are outsourced at the beginning of the end and in-person in the middle, and that outsourcing will just start eating away at the both sides. Um, so, so I do think people will still, I, I, I think in-person science will continue for some time. I think the, the main thing that's always limiting, even when you are pipetting, is doing the experimental design, <laughs> right? Um, we have to think really carefully about what, what experiments we want to do and and every step of that like from deciding what the best the most important question is to answer to actually implementing it and designing all the controls that you could ever possibly need to really learn something from your experiment like that's the real skill um and that's true today as well thank you so much for joining us erica stay tuned to our newsletter or slack for details on our next podcast episodes and thanks for listening